Hello, everyone. It's Tuesday, November 29th. Today, I'm talking with Stephen Bigelow of uh, CandlestickForum.com. We'll also talk about this chopping market environment today. Sell off through the course of the day yesterday. Today, sort of a mixed bag. Some up, some down. We'll look at all the charts together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a snowy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts, using our advanced data visualization techniques to help you better understand the markets with the language of technical analysis. We have a lot to talk about today in terms of a lot of uh, a lot of fluctuations in the market. Number of stocks having some pre pretty decent up days, plenty having some down days as well. With technology lagging the most, down about one percent um, overall, netting out to sort of a mixed result for uh, for the major averages. The Dow and the S and P essentially finishing the day flat, but the Nasdaq, the tech heavy Nasdaq, sort of pushing things down a little bit. We'll look at all those charts here in a few moments. Just wanted to let you know about the upcoming schedule. I'm excited to talk to uh, Steve Bigelow joining the show for the first time today. Tomorrow on November 30th, on Wednesday, we have Javed Mirza of Canaccord Genuity in Toronto. On Thursday the 1st, Miss Schneider of Market Gauge coming back on the show. Then next week on Tuesday the 7th, Leslie Juflas is going to join us from here in the Seattle area. Let's continue on our show today with our market recap. Let's talk about what is happening in the uh, in the markets and particularly from a technical perspective. But first, I want to start with a poll. Ask you recently on our social media accounts. So make sure you follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get all these polls and a great way to participate and see what others are thinking. I asked you recently, you hesitate to sell a losing position mainly because of your emotional connection to that position. Which behavioral bias are you demonstrating? 45% of you correctly answered the endowment bias or the endowment effect. This is where you essentially endow something you own with greater emotional value or greater value because of your emotional attachment to that thing. This is uh, if you've ever had that situation where you have some stocks in your portfolio, stocks start to not work, but instead of selling it, you hold on to it. And it's not because of any evidence you're gathering from the markets. It's because of essentially your emotional attachment to that particular position. Happens a lot, and it's a sneaky one. It's a great reminder to keep your stops updated. And when the chart tells you to take action, take action. 32% of you said confirmation bias. That's related, but that's more when you have a bullish or bearish thesis already, then you start gathering evidence just to support what you were already going to uh, going to uh, to do. Stop loss bias, I got 16% of you to answer that one. I made that one up completely. So if you're not familiar with those behavioral biases like confirmation bias, the endowment bias, narrative bias, go to our chart school page and you can find more info about that. Let's continue on to our market recap and brief shout out to the U.S. men's national team just beating Iran 1-0 to go on to the knockout stage in the World Cup. Well done, team. With our market recap, the S&P 500 down 0.2%, closing the uh, the day just below 39.60. The Nasdaq really leading the way lower, down 0.6%. That's down below 11 uh, 11,000 for the Nasdaq composite. Mid caps and small caps actually uh, an update, but not by much. And volatility is coming off today. So while the uh, S&P flat essentially, the Nasdaq down a bit. Volatility actually uh, came down. Uh, one of our three and three charts yesterday was a chart of the VIX with the S&P 500 because that VIX getting down to that 20 range has usually been a really good indication of a market top, signaling a lower volatility environment, an exhaustion of buyers, essentially, uh, maybe a sign of complacency as the market rallies and uh, and the uptrend uh, has exhausted. So we're right about near those levels here. You may see the VIX get a little bit lower to sort of line up with some of those previous market tops. Looking elsewhere, we have interest rates uh, going higher as bonds sold off a bit today. Ten-year yields around 375 and the long bond yield above uh, 380. The dollar index up a little bit. The UUP was up about 0.2% today. 
Gold and uh, precious metals uh, up today with G the GLD up half a percent, silver up one and a half percent, broader commodity complex uh, doing just fine in the energy sector. One of the top performers, but not the top performer. We'll get to that here in a minute. A lot of green on the charts of cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin up 1.7 percent, just below 16,500. And Ether prices bouncing off of that uh, long term uh, support, potential support level around 1,100, currently just above 1,200. And that's uh, uh, almost 5% higher than yesterday. Briefly, let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. And we'll see what other charts we can get through through the course of our discussion. You know, we've talked about this overall trend in the market. And, and I've uh, been, I, I guess, fairly consistent in sort of uh, reminding everyone about the bearish evidence that we see. And even as we've rallied from mid-October to mid-November, I see signs of concern. Um, the concern that I'm seeing, I think, is best represented by this blue shaded area. This combines combines a Fibonacci uh, resistance level, or what I would expect to be one, 4,000, a number of different frameworks. If you uh, if you line up uh, the uh, highs and lows from January through October, or even on a shorter term from August through October, you'll find that 4,000 continuously comes up as a potential area of resistance. So I'm not surprised the fact that we've stalled out a couple times here attempting to get above 4,000. That also, that blue shaded area also encapsulates, uh, excuse me, encapsulates the 200 day moving average which is currently just above 4050. One of the great indications in August as we rallied and again the sentiment was pretty optimistic here as we made it above the June high, the RSA became overbought indicating certainly an influx of buyers uh and then we stalled up very quickly right as we hit the 200 day moving average, setting up to potentially have a very similar uh read here. Now what's very different is back in August we were entering into the seasonally weakest part of the year and going into September and October I felt very comfortable talking about seasonal weakness and how the chart exhausting at the 200 day would line up very well with those seasonal trends here we actually have the opposite right in mid November through December through the end of the year it's actually the seasonally strongest part of the year you normally expect on an average year for stocks to actually do pretty well particularly in a midterm election year um November December actually tend to be uh, pretty strong January actually tends to be uh, one of the worst months for uh, for stocks so if we would sell off through the end of the year and then rally in January for example that would be the complete opposite of what the normal seasonal tendencies may suggest but I've always thought of seasonal trends as tendencies right and not as absolutes there's no guarantee the market goes up or down on a particular month. Uh, and there are plenty of times when the market can and will buck the trend. So focus on the evidence of the charts. That would be my main takeaway there. To round out our market recap, let's look at the sector leadership and laggardship. We had real estate up on uh, number one today, followed by energy. Both of those up over 1.4% today. And REITs were the top performer up 1.7%. After that, you had financials and industrials both up about two thirds of a percent. About half the sectors were down today, led by technology, which was down uh, 1% or just under that. Utilities after that, consumer staples and consumer discretionary. So, you know, is there a general offense over defense kind of theme? Uh, not really. It's kind of a mix, right? You have real estate, which is a pretty defensive sector up here. But you have industrials that had, had a pretty good day. Energy, which arguably are more uh, sort of uh, offense, sort of cyclical sectors. On the downside, you had technology and utilities, both down about, about the same amount. So this is really sort of a mixed bag. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, I, I would uh, I would argue. Just to finish up here, I was looking at some of the charts in the Mindful Investor uh, live chart list. I just wanted to to, uh, to walk through with you. This is the chart of the VIX. We talked a little bit about that uh, yesterday. One of the charts we we focus on, and now I'm I'm forgetting if that was yesterday or one of the shows last uh, last week. It's a blur over the holiday uh, the holiday season here. But this is the general trend that I was talking about in 2002. When the VIX has pulled down to right around 20, that has been a very meaningful top in stocks. That happened most recently in August and in April, happened in February. And now we've arguably seen that here in the last uh, in the last week or so. Now, the last time I posted a chart like this on social media, I got a lot of pushback with people saying, yeah, but there's no guarantee that the VIX stops at 20. And you are 100% correct. So what I'm saying is if this, what I would call a volatility regime, if this pattern continues, we're kind of at that point. And that's why I think we're at a really important juncture, right? The uh, S&P hitting 4,000, which is a key potential resistance level. Also, the 200-day moving average, which has served as resistance just a little bit above uh, the current price action. The VIX has also pulled back down to 20. So this would be sort of a reasonable time if the bear market phase would continue through year end and into the beginning of next year. This is about where I might expect a cyclical top. 
If that changes, though, right, if we get above those levels, if the VIX goes below 20, if the S&P breaks above 4,100, I think this changes quite a bit, right? It's a different sort of character to the uh, to the chart and a different sense of, uh, of where things are headed. Finally, Brett, you know, I've had a lot of conversations about market breadth, some on this show and some uh, elsewhere. And what I would say is I still see the breadth as relatively neutral. All the advanced decline lines that we normally talk about have gotten above their 50-day moving average, just like the S&P, but none of them yet have broken above their August high. That's around S&P 4,300. For me, I'd need to see these AD lines get above their August high to tell me that there's enough influx of optimism to push stocks potentially to higher highs. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Steve Bigelow. We'll see you in a minute. everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. A couple of quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Stephen Bigelow. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's show, and we'd love to feature one of your questions in our next mailbag segment on Friday's show of this week. You can email us your questions at thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We are also on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions, hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. Larry Williams put on a, a, a market update last week, which was really well done. A lot of interesting charts to think about between now and year end. Our latest episodes of The Pitch and fantastic guest interviews every trading day are at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Steve Bigelow. Steven is the uh, founder, author, and owner of CandlestickForum.com. Steve, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the show. And uh, how are you? Great, Dave. Thanks for having me on. So uh, it's a pleasure. And uh, I've, I've followed you and uh, known you in your work for quite some time. So I'm really excited to share some of your expertise with our audience here. We have a chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average using candlestick analysis, which is the language that you tend to speak. What can you tell us about this chart? What does it tell you about the markets? Well, the nice thing about candlestick charts is it takes everything that you would have on a chart, but it tells you exactly what investor sentiment is doing at the reversals. So there's about 50 or 60 candlestick signals, but you only have to learn 12. There's only what we call the 12 major signals. And so you can see, for example, way over on the left at the very, very top, you could see that was a bearish harami that told you the buying had stopped and then as it started selling off it told us that the 50-day moving average was acting as resistance and we were in a downtrend now the downtrend we use a the eight exponential moving average which we call the t line the trigger line and there's a very extremely high probability that if you see a candlestick sell signal to close below the T-line, you're in a downtrend until you see a candlestick buy signal to close back up above the T-line. So one of our strong indicators or combination is if candlestick signals are the graphic depiction of investor sentiment and the T-line acts like a natural support and resistance level of human nature, when you combine that, you have a very strong trend analysis uh, combination. So there's a difference between bullish trades and a bullish signal. As you can see down at the bottom, that first bottom, that is not a candlestick reversal signal. And the reason that's relevant is the Japanese rice traders have had 400 years to analyze what signals tell us there's a reversal. And that is not a signal that they've identified. So the logic is, if that was some sort of uh, high probability reversal, they would have told us what it was and what the results were. Mm -hmm. Now, if you move over to the right, that next big candle, that's a bullish engulfing signal, and it closes above the T-line, that tells you now you're in an uptrend until you see a candlestick sell signal and a close below the T-line. 
which we saw just here in the last couple of days, there's kind of an evening star signal and the Dow closed right at the T-line and today traded lower. Hmm. That probably told us there's going to be a high probability that they're at least going to come back and test with a 200-day moving average. If you could flip to the NASDAQ chart, mm -hmm. this is even a more compelling. Oh, is that the NASDAQ chart? This is the NASDAQ composite. Is that what okay, you Okay, know? yes, yes, that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. As you can see, over the last few days, there was a doji. The doji is that little cross that tells you there's indecision between the bulls and the bears. Mm. And then they gapped it down. That's called your best friend, because not <laughs> only is the probabilities that the bears have taken control, but there's a high probability that next move is going to be a strong move to the downside. So when you add that all together, you can I use stochastics. My stochastics are 1233 because I'm a swing trader. Mm -hmm. um, and so you got the stochastics heading down. Now you can use RSI or stochastic because basically all you're analyzing is where is the candlestick signal forming? Obviously, a candlestick buy signal in the overbought area doesn't mean anything, or a candlestick sell signal in the oversold area doesn't mean anything. Mm. What we're looking for is that candlestick sell signal in the overbought area or the candlestick buy signal in the oversold area. So as you can see, there was a gap down, your bearish best friend, and a close below the T-line. That told us the probabilities were extremely high they're selling this market off right now. Now, how far? Obviously, you want to see what happens when it hits that first support level. If it goes through there, now we're heading for probably the gap uh, that happened a few weeks ago. So the nice thing about candlestick analysis is it's not conjecture. It's telling you exactly what the buyers and sellers are doing at that level. So it's the actual decision making and if you can apply that to other levels that everybody else is watching, like Fibonacci numbers or Bollinger mm. Bands, it just adds to the credibility of, of what's happening at those levels. We only have about a minute left, uh, C, but I did want to get to the chart of Apple. We were talking before we went live. This was a name you'd been looking at. Can you talk to us about uh, a take on what's happening here? Similar, it looks similar to what we saw at the NASDAQ, right? Uh, yes. So as you can see, over the last four days, there was a bullish candle. And then they gapped it down and did a doji below the previous day's open, which is a very strong selling indication. And mm -hmm. there's a doji rule. The doji rule is the price will usually move in the direction of how they open after a doji. So notice yesterday, what is today? Yesterday, they gapped it down again. That's called a bullish flutter kicker signal. That's one of your strongest reversal signals. Mm -hmm. So you could start shorting immediately based upon the doji rule, knowing what type of pattern was setting up. And that obviously is now showing a very strong sell, which we expect is coming back down to the, the lows of here the last few weeks. Steve, this is such a pleasure to have you on. I hope this is the first of many conversations we can have, because I know there's a lot of wisdom you could share in terms of uh, candlestick analysis. Be well down there in uh, Texas. Stay warm, and we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thank you for having me. That's Steve Bigelow. He's an author and uh, um, owner of CandlestickForum.com. I've, I've uh, I met met Steve years ago. We just uh, got back in touch and had some really fun conversations about candlestick analysis. I was excited to have him come on and share uh, a couple charts with you. What I love about his uh, his uh, discussion there is you saw how he was relating the candle patterns, which is a traditional Japanese form of of technical analysis, which predates. A lot of the techniques that we use, what you call Western technical analysis, was you know created hundreds of years ago by rice traders in uh, in Japan. But connecting that with sort of what I would consider more uh, you know modern day technical analysis, right? More more conventional technical indicators that you might be familiar with. I have always found that candlestick analysis is additive, and it tells you so much about the short term sentiment. I love that take uh, from Steve Bigelow at uh, CandlestickForum.com. Let us continue on our show today with our next segment, The Final Bar Mailbag. As a reminder, the mailbag is always open. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is the best way to get your questions to us. And here is question number one. Dave, on First Solar uh, FSLR, I see a breakout, but also a bearish RSI divergence. Which is right? Oh, I love that question. We actually just had a question on this 
in recent weeks, uh, I think first solar was the same one. We were talking about the scooter rankings, right? And what the, the ranking means. So this is at this point, the top ranked uh, large cap name or the top ranked name uh, using our large cap uh, stock charts, technical ranking system, which is a trend following uh, methodology. So what you're mentioning is, I think this, you're seeing the breakout in first solar going to new highs, but you're seeing the bearish uh, divergence here, right? The high in September, the highs in uh, November, early November and late November, pretty much every one of those with a lower momentum characteristic. So which is right? It's a really good question. So what you're finding is a is a pattern that we uh, that you see actually with a number of stocks right now that have had higher highs recently. A lot of them are doing that on weaker price momentum. For me, that's sort of a red flag of sorts. Um, remember, part of the technical toolkit is more leading and uh, is what I would consider it. And some of the technical toolkit is more lagging, right? Some tools are trying to help you anticipate exhaustion, anticipate when a trend may be ending. And the other set are more lagging indicators, which are meant to confirm once a trend has actually reversed, right? Tell you that an inflection point has actually played out. And there are uh, positives and negatives to both of those approaches. A lot of people like to use a combination of the two, which is kind of generally what I look at, although most of my toolkit, I, you probably uh, categorize as more trend following. But one of the leading indicators I look at are divergences. So here's what I would say. At the end of the day, I think price is most important. So as long as First Solar keeps going higher, I would want to continue to own a name like First Solar if I did, as long as the price keeps going high, right? A trend is uh, in place until it is proven otherwise. So I would tend to give the benefit of the doubt to a price going higher, making higher highs and higher lows. That is sort of the classic definition of an uptrend. That's what I would pay attention to. The fact that the momentum is waning is what puts it on a, uh, a warning list for me. I would often put that on a watch list, put it in a special chart list to monitor those charts. Those are my you know, sort of the uh, the um, on the on deck circle, and then we'll see which ones actually start to break down. One of the charts we highlighted recently that has a very similar kind of look uh, would be Netflix, right? If you look at the highs in October and the high in November, that's on weaker momentum, sort of became overbought on that first one, but did not reach the overbought condition on the second one. That's a bearish uh, sign. Overall, the price hasn't broken down a ton. So at this point, I would tend to think the benefit of the doubt is higher until you break down. And so this puts it on the warning list. A breakdown below 250, for example, would confirm the fact that this uh, stock is in a uh, is in a weak position overall. So that's how I would think about it. I think at this point, the trend is positive, but you have a potential exhaustion signal. So make sure the stops are updated. Think about what, what's your line in the sand? At what level would you agree to revisit a long position, for example, if you'd have it? on that particular chart. Thanks for that question. Next question, Gilead, G-I-L-D, is showing an all-time high in 2015 at $96, but the unadjusted chart underscore G-I-L-D is shown as $123. How does stock charts deduct dividends from the stock price? And you went on in your question, and thanks so much for, put, for putting in a, a very thoughtful, complete question. You sort of added, um, you know, usually the dividend payment is reflected in price. The stock will open lower by the same dividend amount on the next trading day pending any market related move. So on the stock charts platform, you have two ways of bringing up a symbol. You can just bring it, in, uh, bring it up normally. And when you do that, when you bring up your monthly chart of Gilead uh, using just the regular ticker symbol, we always use adjusted data, which means we adjust the historical data series for, um, uh, for splits and then for dividend payments. And I'll show you how we do it here in a moment underscore G-I-L-D will basically give you the unadjusted data. Now we're still adjusting for splits, but we don't adjust for the dividends. So then you can see the all-time high in Gilead was 123.37. So on that trading day or wherever that, that month, that was the high point. That was the point that the stock actually traded. Now, the reason why you adjust it, you can't really see it on a monthly chart, but on a daily chart, you would see the little price gaps, right? And so when a dividend pays out, the whole price series actually bumped down a little bit to accommodate for the dividend, basically a portion of the stock's value is paid out to investors in the form of a dividend. What happens with the dividend adjustment is when the dividend is paid off, instead of lowering the current price by a certain dividend, you basically uh, take the new price and you take all the other price data lower to adjust lower for the dividend. So when you adjust all of that and basically take all the dividend um, you know, gaps out of the chart, that makes an adjusted all-time high around 96.40. If what I said is completely confusing to you, I apologize, but I will tell you what you can do. Our director of content, Jayanti, just actually wrote an article on this particular topic. So if you go to the articles page on stockcharts.com, there is a blog called 
Stock charts in focus. And if you go there, there's an article that says dividends are adjusted or unadjusted charts the way to go. She did a great job showing you some recent examples and what the adjustments actually do to your analysis of the stock price. So that is a great way to get some more info on that particular adjustment. Next question regarding Nucor, ticker NUE. Oh, sorry. Do you still think that the overall condition for Nucor is constructive when you consider the RSI? Or is it better to wait for a pullback? Let me show you the chart of Nucor. NUE at, at one point was actually the top ranked uh, scooter stock. It is uh, down quite a bit. That was in the first quarter, if I remember right. It was actually scoring very, very well. From there, it's uh, floundered quite a bit, but recently sort of breaking above this uh, August and September high, which I think. Uh, could be pretty uh, pretty important. I think that's what I mentioned recently on the show. Getting above 145 is uh, is pretty uh, is pretty uh, positive. At least that's what I would probably have have said. Now you're also pointing out the fact that it's overbought. So isn't that a bad thing that things are overbought? So here's the thing. Yes and no. I guess is the way I would describe it. As a trend follower, I like charts that are breaking to new highs, have a a basing pattern, have a level of resistance where we finally break above that. Just like if we would break down through a key support level, I would take that as a very negative signal because that means that buyers that previously thought this is a pretty decent buy are not really coming in, right? In this case, Nucor actually did make a uh, sort of a double bottom pattern. It tested the Ju July low, found support there. Buyers came in just as they did uh, in the, uh, in the uh, summer and pushed the price back to the upside. Now we're testing resistance. And for now, we've broken above it. Although since you sent in this question, we're pulling back and we're testing that breakout level around 145 Yet again, when we become overbought, it's similar to a bearish engulfing pattern. It's something to uh, to watch to see if we get a pullback. I think, to be honest with you, I think Steve Bigelow's comments on candlestick analysis could be very relevant here, right? Seeing a bearish candle pattern as we attempt to break out would tell me something very different than if the price breaks out and we see nice increased volume and an influx of demand as the price uh, breaks out. So a lot of times when a chart breaks out of a uh, of a resistance level, you will often become overbought. The question is what happens on the pullback? And in general, I usually don't talk a lot about actual trading strategies because my, my goal here is not to recommend things or to give you specific entry and exit points necessarily because I'm not here to recommend any positions. That's what our disclaimers hopefully make very, very clear. My job is to illustrate the best practices of technical analysis and in general, Best charts I have found are ones that are breaking out, but pull back a little bit, which means this pullback to a breakout level is often a really good entry point, which is why Nucor, I think, could be a really interesting chart to watch as long as it holds that breakout level. Because when a stock rallies, it will often become overbought and then stay overbought. You saw that in March, April, May. You saw that in the first quarter and second quarter of 2021 as well. That's it for the mailbag, guys. Thank you so much for sending in those great questions. Keep them coming. We'll get some more as soon as we can. We got to wrap the show, the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. I was looking through some of my ratio charts today, and I found this one, which I thought was a really interesting one. If you look at the relative strength of the S&P versus ACWI, which is the all country world index, sort of global stocks, it includes everything, US, global developed, global emerging all together. Um, you can see that the ratio broke below its 200 day moving average. Today, that's the first time it's been below the 200-day moving average since the first quarter of 2021. Now, why are U.S. stocks underperforming global stocks here in the last month? It's the dollar, and that's the index that you see at the bottom, dollar sign USD, you see breaking down. If you expect that dollar weakness to continue, this ratio tells you all you need to know about as a U.S.-based investor, should I be leaning into the international portion of a portfolio? That ratio goes lower. The argument would be absolutely, because weaker dollar means global markets have a much uh, po more positive uh, potential impact on your portfolio. Here's chart number two. I was looking at the technology sector, the worst performer uh, today. You can see the S&P 500 since uh, mid-August. This is uh, the close on August 12th. From there, the S&P is down 5.5%. Technology down 12.1%. The material sector is up 2.1% during that same period. I think even though our benchmarks are struggling, even though they've potentially exhausted a move to the upside, and even though the growthy stuff is really struggling, you can see that the material sector is positive. Finally, Freeport McMoran FCX potentially having a bullish pennant pattern above the 200-day. Can it hold 36? That's the question. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank Stephen Bigelow from CandlestickForum.com joining us from the Houston area. Great take on candlestick analysis. Make sure you check out all of our chart school articles on candlestick analysis. A lot of great wisdom from John Murphy and many others. All of our previous interviews, 
are at StockChartsTV.com. For Stock Charts and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, be well. We'll see you tomorrow.